Hello, I'm John Ebert. Welcome to class number four in our uh, course on understanding contemporary art. And this time what I'd like to do is to shift our discussion to abstract expressionism. And uh, in these next two videos, I want to discuss the works of Jackson Pollock. Um, with abstract expressionism now, uh, we're sort of still in the modernist world. It's not yet exactly the world of contemporary art. Arthur Danto famously marks the beginnings of contemporary art with uh, Andy Warhol putting the Brillo box into a museum in 1963. But I like to look back at the abstract expressionists. For one thing, they're already there in New York, and the capital of art has already shifted from Paris to New York with them, which already tends to indicate that um, we've shifted into a new epoch, just as in the 17th century, uh, the capital of art, uh, Rome, shifted to the Netherlands, signifying a new world age in art. Same thing here. We're moving into a new world age, and at first, the new sensibility of the new epoch, that is to say of contemporary art, expresses itself initially through the form language of the preceding epoch, that, that is to say the epoch of modernism. Uh, but then, as we will see here, and the key thing I want to look at is that both Pollock and Mark Rothko pretty quickly wiped the slate clean. Their work consists of a deconstruction and dismantling and a dissolving, a liquefaction, as it were, of the basic archetypes of modernist art. The slate is wiped clean, as Rothko himself famously remarked, and moves us into the epoch of contemporary art. So they constitute, abstract expressionism kind of constitutes an intermediate period here between modernism and contemporary art. What I want to do here is do uh, to look at uh, the topologies, the geometrical topologies of the preceding two epochs. Um, as we saw, the epoch of perspectival art took place uh, using Cartesian coordinate phase space with an X, Y, Z axis. This was a three-dimensional phase space. And the lines are largely rectilinear. This is the Newtonian Cartesian phase space in which objects come into being in three dimensions from one point of view, and they are very rectilinear. Um, the proper geometry, though, as we've already seen from modernist art, is basically non-Euclidean. And as we see with this hypersphere, it has more the sense of an n-dimensional three-sphere or a hypersphere which is to say uh, a sphere with multiple dimensions that's constantly in the process of creating and destroying itself, creating and destroying itself. It's moving, but it's decidedly non-Euclidean, which is to say that the geometry is basically curvilinear, which is we've seen from Cezanne. Uh, Cezanne painted basically on curved space, uh, as Gene Gebser remarked in uh, Ever-Present Origin, all the way down to Jackson Pollock. They paint uh, in, uh, sort of, it's as though they were on the inside of a hypersphere uh, painting the modernist iconotypes, namely the Jungian archetypes of the collective unconscious, uh, like a Paleolithic artist on the inside of a cave painting the animal forms. But the geometry, I think, um, for contemporary art is closer to what the contemporary theoretician Peter Sloterdijk calls foam. That is to say, and here this is an image of what's known as sphere packing, where there are so many different microspheres packed together, and each artist is creating his own sort of private cosmology. Um, and so it's more like a kind of foamic a formless phomic ontology uh, where each artist creates his own microsphere and they're all sort of rubbing up against each other and they're sort of creating, it's no longer a single world sphere as in modernism that everyone is practicing uh, the basic rules and parameters of modern to start with, but mul multiple spheres. So what I want to do then is to move directly into Pollock's group and to look at the first half of it in this discussion. Here we see self-portrait uh, of 1930. This is a very early self-portrait of him. 1930, when he's still painting, I believe, in Arizona at this point, Arizona or California. And uh, this has a kind of mask-like feel to it. And indeed, I think that the primary uh, alter ego of Jackson Pollock, I think what we'll see is that of the masked shamanic uh, icon. He is the shaman. That is his alter ego. Anytime he paints a masked shamanic uh, being in his art, it really is Pollock's alter ego. He's casting himself in the role of the, the shaman. And the other great archetype here, and these are indeed Jungian archetypes. Pollock studied Jungian uh, psychoanalysis. He went, he had a Jungian analyst for a while. Here is the great mother. Uh, this, this painting is called Mother from 1930, and it is the other great archetype uh, in Pollock's art. And so what we'll see is the shaman and the great mother are the two sort of mythic archetypes for the first half of his art, which therefore takes place firmly still within uh, the modernist hypersphere. Uh, this is Pollock's first great painting, I think, his first masterpiece. This is the 1938 painting known as Birth. And in it, Pollock has famously modeled a, a Native American totem pole. Um, but it has an interesting kind of downward gravitational pull to it that I want to draw your attention to here. The downward gravitational pull is already a foreshadowing of Pollock taking the canvas 
uh, the vertical canvas and laying it horizontally flat onto the ground and trading out his paint brush for the dipstick that he dips into a can and drips the paint over across the canvas. And in doing that, note that he is using gravity. Gravity becomes one of the, for the first time in the history of art, or at least in the history of Western European art, certainly Tibetan sand painters and Navajo sand painters were using gravity. Gravity becomes a tool in the repertoire of the artist. And I think this sort of downward gravitational pull of these massed ancestral beings um, is already looking ahead to that axial shift in, in Pollock's art. This is the kind of uh, Eskimo shamanic mask that inspired Pollock to paint uh, this painting, very much like Picasso used the masks of the African uh, of African art uh, in his uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, as we have seen. And this is the this is Totem too, one of the last paintings. This is later in 1944, one of the last paintings that Pollock paints uh, of himself in the role of the masked shamanic uh, ancestor being. And we'll see what happens to that being as we go along here. This is the stenographic woman that he painted in 1942 that famously confounded Peggy Guggenheim when she tried to exhibit it. It's very, people didn't know what to make of it. It caused a stir at the time when it came out because it's very hard to read, but essentially what you're looking at is indeed a dialogue with Manet's Olympia and Paul Gauguin's Nevermore, uh, going back to Velazquez's Woman with a Mirror. It's the great goddess. Uh, here she's the stenographic woman. She's lying horizontally from left to right. Her head there is visible on the left. And, she, and her legs are splayed open uh, on the right-hand side there. And she's surrounded by what look like mathematical equations, but she is painted very, very much on the inside of that modernist hypersphere I was talking about, where the, the, the geometry of the space is curvilinear, and it looks like a light ray or an Einsteinian geodesic is rapidly following uh, a sort of Minkowskian world line through the space-time in this space. But this is very definitely still within the modernist hypersphere. Um, now, in this painting, this is interesting. This is the She-Wolf of 1943, which was deliberately and directly inspired from Paleolithic art. Pollock is painting uh, a wolf, which is basically one of the things that a shaman could transform himself into. The shaman has the, uh, the ability to become an animal, or a becoming animal, to put it in the language of the philosopher Gilles Deleuze. A becoming animal, and here Pollock is sort of casting his alter ego as the shaman wolf. But note the shift in axial orientation of the spinal column. Uh, the spinal column... Here we have an image of the traditional spinal column of the human spinal column as the bipedal. It's upright in a vertical orientation. And painting, throughout the entire history of painting, the artist has had a vertical axis to the spinal column. Uh, but now with Pollock, the axis begins to shift to a horizontal axis, and a horizontal axis of the spinal column means that there's a becoming animal aspect to this. And Pollock, I think, is already looking ahead here, as in this painting here, of him leaning over the canvas doing his drip paintings where we can see his spinal axis has shifted from the traditional vertical orientation for centuries of European art to now a horizontal orientation which is more like that of an animal. It's got a kind of becoming animal aspect to it which shifts Pollock now. There's a kind of assemblage going on here where um, there's a kind of human animal planet configuration that's assembling itself here. Pollock really is the first planetary artist and I want to emphasize this that he is the first to sort of lay the canvases flat on the earth, and it, it is as though very much as though he were painting on the earth itself as its canvas, using the curvature surrounding the earth as one of the tools for his art. Paul Virilio stated famously that Pollock, uh, in his canvases, in his drip paintings, was famously foreshadowing the Sputnik satellite going around the earth. The first of those would go around the earth in 1957, 10 years after his 1947 discovery of his drip paintings looking down at the earth the same way Pollock looks down at the earth here, and uh, it becomes sort of part of the earth, and in a sense becomes the foundations for what later becomes land art. Land art with Michael Heiser and Robert Smithson and Andy Goldsworthy, which is a kind of miniature version of land art. Um, Michael Heiser, all, all those individuals sort of presuppose the earth as, a, as their canvas. It's as though they were painting on the earth itself uh, as though it were a canvas for them. Uh, and this 1943 painting is called Pasiphae now. Uh, it was originally entitled Moby Dick. Moby Dick is about the hunt for the great mythical Leviathan. And here it changes to Pasiphae, who is a female protagonist. She was the one who was associated with the famous Greek Minotaur. But here I think he's invoking the myth, uh, like the Babylonian myth of the great uh, creator god Marduk, who carves the goddess Tiamat up into pieces and creates the cosmos out of pieces of her body. I think Pollock is beginning to sacrifice here his archetype of the Great Mother. She's one of the famous archetypes of modernist art, and she's made famous, for example, by Picasso. 
uh, who reiterates her over and over again all through his art, but here he's sacrificing her, pulling her apart, um, <clears throat> and is about to create a new cosmos out of the pieces of her body. Here we have the 1943 painting Guardians of the Secret, which is already, uh, the secret basically is that the middle rectangle there is the non-figurative cosmos that Pollock is going to create out of the pieces of the body of the Great Mother, uh, and he's going to sort of as it were symbolically use his own blood to animate it, which uh, we'll see in the next lecture. And in this last image from this period we have Night Mist of 1944, where we can see the cosmos that he's constructing out of the pieces of the sacrificed body of the Great Mother here are getting more and more abstract, more and more non-figurative, and Pollock is beginning to wipe clean from the interior of the hypersphere of modernist art all of its structuring iconotypes, which were basically geometrical on the one hand, like platonic uh, geometrical archetypes in Cubism, and Jungian on the other, which consisted of figures as we have seen, like the shaman, the great mother, the hero, the wise old man, and so forth. Those are all going down the drain now, and as they go down the drain, so too the modernist hypersphere will also go down the drain and free up a whole new ontological field for the proliferation of spheres within spheres within spheres as contemporary art begins to run rampant, which we'll see uh, uh, coming up here in these next few videos.